I'm James Worrell from the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Ottawa, and today I'm going to give you a brief introduction to point-of-care ultrasound in first trimester pregnancy. Let's start with a case you'll see almost every day in the eMERGE. A woman in early pregnancy presents with some bleeding. She's worried about whether the pregnancy is okay. What are you worried about? Well, if you aren't thinking ectopic, you aren't an emergency doc. Why? Because there's a 5 to 10% chance that this woman has a life-threatening diagnosis. And unfortunately, we can't rule it out using history and physical exam. So in emergency medicine, every symptomatic first trimester pregnant patient has an ectopic until proven otherwise. There are risk factors for ectopic pregnancy, but for all intensive purposes, they are useless. Because we can't safely reduce the risk to a reasonable level just using the risk factors. What have we learned so far? It's an ectopic until proven otherwise, and we can't rule it out with our history and physical exam. So we're left with a clinical problem. We have a high-risk patient, and we can't exclude the diagnosis we're worried about. Therefore, we need another approach, and that means using ultrasound. So you might think, I'm going to tell you all about the ultrasound findings of ectopic pregnancy. Well, I'm not. Why? Because most often, you will not see the ectopic. In fact, it's only picked up about half the time on ultrasound. It's especially hard with transabdominal sonography. However, if we can be sure we see a pregnancy in the uterus, then by definition, it's not ectopic. In that case, the patient's risk of having a life-threatening diagnosis has dropped from 5 to 10% all the way down to 0.01%. Why do I say that? Because there's only an ectopic if the patient has twins, one ectopic and one intrauterine, which is called a heterotopic pregnancy and is rare. So if we rule in intrauterine pregnancy, we effectively rule out ectopic. The exception to this is cases of assisted reproduction such as IVF, because in those cases, the risk of heterotopic is thought to be much higher perhaps as high as 1 in 100. So how do we know that the pregnancy is in the uterus? The first step, and this is critical, is to make sure we are looking at the uterus. Ectopic pregnancies will often cause a tissue reaction in the tube, and, that, and the tissue around the ectopic will resemble uterine tissue. You might see that ectopic pregnancy and think, great, it's in the uterus. If you haven't clearly identified the uterus and its borders, you're asking for trouble. So the first thing we look for is bladder uterine juxtaposition. Here is a longitudinal view of the bladder and the uterus. The probe is held against the symphysis pubis with the probe indicator toward the patient's head. In the top right of the screen, you see a black fluid-filled structure. That's the bladder. Behind it, you see a pear-shaped structure. That's the uterus. You may also notice, deep to the bladder, a white line. That's the vaginal stripe, the anterior and posterior walls of the vagina in apposition. Within the uterus, there's another white stripe, and that's called the endometrial stripe. Once we've identified the uterus, the next step is to look for a gestational sac, which is a black circular structure inside the uterus. Here it is, here. Once we found a gestational sac, we need to see something inside it. We look for a yolk sac or a fetal pole, or both. On this image, we see the uterus and the gestational sac Within the gestational sac, there is a round circular structure. Looks like a white ring. That's the yolk sac. Here's another image also showing a yolk sac. And here's a video clip, again, showing the yolk sac. As the operator sweeps through the gestational sac, you see the yolk sac coming in and out of view. On this image, we can also see a fetal pole. Here's a clip of the same thing. 
When you see a fetal pole, you may actually see a cardiac flicker, the fetal heart within it. It's important to know that this is not required to diagnose an intrauterine pregnancy. The final thing we look for is the myometrial mantle. It must be eight millimeters or greater. This is the thickness of the wall of the uterus around the gestational sac. On this image, you can see the operator has measured the myometrial mantle at its thinnest point, and it measures 1.1 centimeters, which is obviously greater than eight millimeters, so that's okay. Why do we care about the myometrial mantle? because of the phenomenon of interstitial or corneal ectopic. This is when an ectopic pregnancy implants in the part of the tube that is penetrating the muscular wall of the uterus. So when you look at the image, the pregnancy may actually appear to be within the uterus. It's important to always measure the myometrial mantle to avoid being fooled by an interstitial ectopic. Here is an image of an interstitial ectopic. This is an early pregnancy, so we don't even see a yolk sac, but you can see how the gestational sac is eccentrically located within the uterus. It's not in the middle. You really have to know these IUP criteria cold and live by them, or you could harm patients by calling an IUP when there isn't one. If you don't fulfill all the IUP, IUP criteria, or if you're not sure, then your interpretation should be NDIUP. No definite intrauterine pregnancy. There's a reason we insist on seeing the yolk sac or fetal pole inside the gestational sac. Here, you see a small fluid-filled filled round structure within the uterus. Is this an early gestational sac? Could be. Or is it a pseudogestational sac, something that can occur in ectopic pregnancy? The pregnancy may be somewhere else, but you get something that looks like a poss possible gestational sac in the uterus. Yikes. Don't call this an IUP. Of course, if you follow these criteria, you're never going to call it an IUP because you don't see a yolk sac or a fetal pole inside that gestational sac. Now, many doctors have fallen into what I call the beta HCG trap. That's when the doctor or the radiologist says, I'm not going to do this ultrasound because the beta is too low. I won't see anything. What do they mean by too low? Well, they mean that the beta is below the discriminatory threshold. This is the level of beta above which you should see a healthy IUP if it is there. The reason this is faulty logic is because we, of course, don't know that this is a healthy IUP. In fact, we're worried that it's an ectopic. Beta doesn't rise normally in ectopic pregnancies. Indeed, half of ectopics are diagnosed at beta levels of less than 1,000, well below the discriminatory thresholds. So how is the beta useful at all? I'll tell you. This is a very simplified algorithm for dealing with our clinical problem, the case that we started with. We see a woman with first trimester pain or bleeding. First thing we do is our point of care ultrasound. If we see an IUP, fantastic, we've ruled out ectopic, unless it happens to be an assisted reproduction pregnancy. We may be unable to comment on viability, but the patient can safely be discharged because we have excluded the life-threatening diagnosis. On the other hand, if we see a clear ectopic, then we want to call our gynecology colleagues. The third possibility is we have an NDIUP. We should look for free fluid in the pelvis and abdomen, but assuming the patient is stable, we can check the beta. Now, if the beta is above the discriminatory threshold, we think, that's not right. We should be seeing a pregnancy in the uterus. Where is that pregnancy? Must be ectopic. And we call gyne. If the beta is below the discriminatory threshold, then we are left with a pregnancy of unknown location. We can check serial betas usually every 48 hours, organize a follow-up ultrasound, and make sure the patient has close follow-up. The diagnosis will be made based on the rate of change of the beta and further imaging.
So now you know how to use first trimester point of care ultrasound. Let's do a quick review. Remember, there's a high risk of a serious diagnosis here, and every symptomatic first trimester patient has an ectopic until proven otherwise. The criteria for an IUP are critical to ensure we don't label a potential ectopic as an IUP, so memorize these. Finally, a few pitfalls to remind you. Look out for the patient who underwent fertility treatment. Don't rely on the beta HCG to tell you whether or not you need that ultrasound. If you don't see an IUP, don't forget to look for free fluid in the pelvis in Morrison's pouch, signs of rupture. And finally, don't let your point of care ultrasound overrule your clinical judgment. You're a good clinician and you have to trust your judgment even if the ultrasound disagrees with it. Thanks for listening. Now let's get out there and practice our ultrasound skills.